Right now on News 3, continued team coverage of the historic flooding now leading to new concerns for Dane County. This is News 3 at 10. Thanks for joining us tonight. Day three of the flooding aftermath and now officials turn their concern to rising lake levels as water from overfilled Lake Mendota now released downstream. The people around Lake Mendota preparing for the flood. Amy Reed joins us now. She is live near Lake Mendota where you can see just how much water we're talking about. Amy. Yeah, it's very full here on Mendota. That's why the county opened up the Tenny Locks, hoping to let some of that water out. But that means about three to six inches coming way for the people downstream. So they spent the day preparing for what's to come next. Let's roll it and then uh, we can put some on top. At this point, Tim Nicholson is used to this. It's a hundred year flood that happens every three or four years. Bare feet and hard work. Well, it's a mud pit. So either you got wet bare feet or you got wet feet and shoes. He and his neighbors are lining each other's backyards with sandbags, hoping it will create enough of a barrier for when water comes in. The county said plan on three to six inches on top of an already dicey situation. Before that, we were about an inch from going over the uh, berms and stuff like that. So, uh, so three to six inches, we know there's going to be some flooding. So just trying to coordinate all that and get everybody here together. It's been a lot of work today. Everyone that can is trying to help out, even inmates from the jail. It's nice to see everybody out here helping. Water already covered East Johnson Street on its way to Monona. Soon after we shot this video, the city had to close it down. Bike paths in Tenney Park are also covered, getting more use from ducks than cyclists. The burrito. Oh, I think that bought us four inches anyway. Nicholson hopes he and his neighbors are ready. He said if everyone sandbags, they might be able to keep this flood at bay. So he wants all the help he can get. So if you have any young kids that are need to get out and get some exercise, send them on down. The city and county have people down here keeping an eye on things. Not too long ago, they moved us from the shelter lot across the street. They said the water was just coming up too fast. Something we'll keep an eye on. Amy, Eric? Amy Reed reporting live tonight. Amy, thank you very much. The Clean Lakes Alliance says Lake Wabisa has officially reached 100 year flood levels. The organization tweeted this photo this afternoon saying uh, that Lake Wabisa reached a level of 847.01 feet late this afternoon. That surpasses the 100 year level of 847 feet. They say other area lakes, including Mendota, Monona, Kaganza, are also close to those 100 year levels. An update from Belleville tonight. People there are starting to clean up. After water from the Sugar River rushed through their neighborhoods, the river hit dangerously high levels last night going over the dam, but that water has receded several feet. Eight families did have to be evacuated, but they are now back in their homes. The next concern becomes for people downstream who lived downstream along the Sugar River. This is a video from the village of Albany. While police are calling it minor flooding, they are asking people to avoid high water. Let's check in now with Chief Meteorologist Gary Canalti, who has the very latest in our first alert forecast. Gary. Well, Eric, we continue to watch the chances for rain. Tomorrow I shouldn't have no problem at all. I think it'll be dry, skies will be sunny. You can see on Doppler track right now things very quiet across uh, the upper Midwest. But by Friday, there's already a severe weather threat uh, over southwestern Wisconsin for an isolated strong to severe thunderstorm. But more importantly is the rainfall potential. And this is through 9 a.m. Saturday morning, calling now for generally about an inch to an inch and a half of rain over southern Wisconsin. This is up from the previous computer model forecast. And there could be some localized two or three inch amounts in some spots. Who gets the heaviest amounts? Still hard to say. But again, uh, any additional rainfall for those areas who have had too much rain, just not a good thing. So we have an alert day in the forecast for Friday for showers and thunderstorms and the possibility of locally heavy rainfall. Also an isolated strong to severe thunderstorm. Low temperatures this morning started out in the middle 50s with the air being dry. Current temperatures are in the middle to upper 50s. Dew point temperatures now climbing into the lower 50s, still not too humid. And as we check out our forecast first, look for temperatures to drop into the middle 50s by early tomorrow morning. Look for plenty of sunshine for tomorrow. Our high temperature at 77. That's your first alert forecast. Gary, thanks. We are now learning more about the 70 year old killed in those rushing floodwaters. Jim Sewell was identified this afternoon. He is remembered by so many throughout Wisconsin. Our Jamie Perez spoke with his family and a former colleague who worked by his side for more than 23 years. It shares his story. 
Eric, it was obviously a very emotional day for family and friends. Even if you didn't know him personally, you probably know his work. He was the senior historic preservation architect working on the state capitol, the first Unitarian church, and so much more. He was also known as an expert in fixing flood-damaged buildings. 13 hours search for a missing man in historic floodwaters. The rushing water in dangerous conditions took Jim Sewell's life. Shock, utter shock. You know, it, I think everybody has been paying attention to that story because it's such a heartbreaking story. And to learn that it's one of your colleagues, it's very hard. Jim Drager worked alongside Sewell for more than 23 years at Wisconsin's Historical Society. What do you think you are going to miss the most about Jim being gone? Um, him. Yeah, just miss him. He's a great man. A great man who his daughters loved more than anything. I don't know why he got taken so soon. Everything, <laughs> everything he did, he did for he did selflessly for everyone else. A man who did anything for anyone, even through his last breath. He helps my uncle and his girlfriend out of the waters, and when he tried to help himself, he got swept away. A tragedy they now have to live with every day, but they still remember the good. They say that's what he would have wanted. His jokes and yeah. even though they were dumb, <laughs> it was we're still celebrating the dumb jokes. A jokester and always smiling, even when they saw him at the funeral home this morning. It's nice just to see him. He was even smiling this morning. <laughs> he really was. <laughs> I don't think he could help it. It's no secret he was a very loved and very influential man, someone who will be remembered for his contributions and character. He has such a fan base and he was such a big personality that he I was. think that, that was that's part of the reason that it's such a it's and I think it broke off into both of us. <laughs> is because all of a sudden this giant personality, this um, wonderful person is just is gone. Gone. Obviously a very well liked and well respected man, both professionally and personally. Jim's family spent the afternoon at the funeral home making arrangements for his funeral. So they're planning for a viewing next Wednesday and the reception next Thursday at the All Saints Church. There's also gonna be a full obituary on Sunday and a notice in the paper tomorrow with funeral information. Uh, no doubt the biggest loss in all of this, a huge loss for our community, Jamie Perez in our news center. Jamie, thank you. Residents continue to clean up after floods damaged dozens of homes in Mazomani. Local firefighter Pete Peterson says he and his wife were focused on community efforts when the water started to fill their own home. So we figured, you know, we've got time to help fill sandbags before we need to deal with our house. And um, no, we didn't. <laughs> Peterson, along with family and friends, spent today cleaning out the home on State Street. There, water filled his entire basement and parts of his first floor Tuesday morning. It is unclear if the home is a total loss. A local bank has started an assistance fund to help people affected by flooding in the Mazo area. Officials with the People's Community Bank said the Mazo Mania area flood assistance fund is accepting donations to help people in Mazo Mania, Arena, Barneveld, Plain, Spring Green, and Richland Center. Proceeds from the fund will be allocated based on need to affected homeowners. Governor Walker says he will be touring the flood damage on foot tomorrow. After taking this aerial tour today, he declared a state of emergency yesterday for Dane County. The governor, along with County Executive Joe Parisi and Sheriff Dave Mahoney, held a press conference today. Sheriff Mahoney getting emotional, thanking his first responders, calling Monday a night of heroes. I'm so very proud of our emergency workers, our police officers, our deputy sheriffs, our volunteer firefighters who in their own communities abandoned their homes that are gone today, but yet continue, continue to rise to the occasion of helping their neighbors. Our public servants in Wisconsin and in Dane County and throughout our region have placed service to others before service to themselves. And that's what this is all about. And bags and things like that provide Governor Walker says the people impacted by this flooding will get financial assistance from the local and state levels. It is unclear, however, if this devastation reaches the very high bar to get 
federal assistance. Railroad routes coming into Madison from the west are out of commission due to what's being called incurable significant damage following Monday night storm. The route that runs from Madison through Dane County and out to Prairie du Chien completely cut off now. The damage specifically bad west of Middleton out to Black Earth. Flooding causing trouble for farmers as well. An EMT was called out to help a cow overnight stranded in flood water near Attica. That's just south of Belleville. Members of the Albany Volunteer Fire Department also had to get a herd of cattle to safety. The river there in Albany has risen about six inches just since this morning. That injured cow, by the way, is expected to be just fine. Madison Memorial High School back to being fully operational now after experiencing flooding and a loss of power during the storm. They say it appears there was no permanent damage to the school. At least five feet of water was in the parking lot on Monday. Water also covered the athletic fields there and was running into the school's entryways. The school will still need to work with a contractor just to make sure there's nothing that they missed. They are still trying to dry things out, the walls, the floors. Are could also be some damage to those fields as well as the roof and ceiling tiles. News 3 will continue to spend time in those communities most affected by this week's flooding. We'll have the latest on News 3 this morning, and as always, you can find it at channel3000.com. And still to come tonight at 10, Janesville police announced charges for the city's first homicide of the year and a new Marquette Law School poll. What it says about the upcoming midterm elections, that's next on News 3 at 10. Stay with us. In other news today, Wisconsin Badger wide receiver Danny Davis will be suspended for the first two games of the season for his alleged involvement in an alleged sexual assault. Davis's roommate, junior wide receiver Quintez Cephas, was charged earlier this week with sexual assault of two intoxicated women. That incident happened back in April. According to the criminal complaint on Cephas, Davis is accused of laughing at the women and taking photos. We'll hear from head coach Paul Christ coming up in sports. A Janesville woman facing reckless homicide charges accused of killing a man late last night. 20 year old Serena Stone now in police custody accused of stabbing her ex-boyfriend. 26 year old Robert Thomas Jr. last night in the Wall Street Apartments parking lot that is on the west side of Janesville. 
Police say Stone stabbed Thomas in the chest before dropping him off at the hospital and confessing to police. They say their relationship has a history of domestic violence. New tonight at 10, a retired Beloit police officer has been federally indicted, accused of repeated sexual assault of a teenage girl, Larry Woods, facing federal charges, including two counts of transporting a minor across state lines with intent to engage in sexual activity. He was arrested in June. According to the criminal complaint, Woods sexually assaulted the girl for seven months. His trial is ex expected to begin in February. We're getting a first look at just how competitive the midterm races will be here in Wisconsin. Both major races for governor and U.S. Senate are within the margin of error, according to a Marquette Law School poll just out today. Incumbent Republican Governor Scott Walker and Democratic State Superintendent of Public Instruction Tony Evers are tied 46 percent among voters who say they are likely to vote in November. Libertarian candidate Phil Anderson gets six percent. Just two percent say they don't know at this time. In the race for U.S. Senate, incumbent Democratic Senator Tammy Baldwin leads Republican State Senator Leah Voopmeer 49 to 47 percent, just 3 percent undecided there, also within the margin of error. The poll also finding nearly 70 percent of both Republicans and Democrats say they are enthusiastic about voting in this election. We want to let you know about a special Facebook Live event we are hosting here at News 3 where you can ask experts about your mental health concerns heading into the school year. This transition can be especially tough for you and your children, so our partners at SSA Health are helping with a free Q&A tomorrow evening, 5 to 6 p.m. Our Danica Lewis will moderate the discussion. Feel free to send your questions ahead of time by tweeting them to Danica at Danica Lewis or post them on our Facebook page. You can also email them to us with the hashtag time to talk or simply ask them live Thursday, 5 to 6 during this live event. Check out this video from the International Space Station high above Hurricane Lane that is in the Pacific. The storm currently a powerful category four capable of causing severe damage. A hurricane warning is in effect for Hawaii's Big Island. That was extended to the island of Maui now. A hurricane watch is in effect for the rest of the state, including its most heavily populated city of Honolulu, something that our chief meteorologist Gary Canalti has been watching as well. Yeah, the, the problem is, as Lane approaches from the south, it's going to put the Hawaiian Islands on the strong side of the storm. And so they're going to get the brunt of it. Uh, hopefully it stays far enough offshore to lessen some of the effects. But let's start out by taking a look and see what Lane has been up to for the last 12 hours. Uh, it has been a very strong Category 4, at times borderline Category 5 hurricane as it moves to the west-northwest. And now it's starting to shift the direction to the northwest at about 8 miles per hour. Maximum sustained winds 145 miles per hour at 100 155. It's a Category 5 hurricane, so we're just splitting hairs at that point. But uh, ma uh, wind gusts to 190 miles per hour possible with Lane. Now, the forecast from the National Hurricane Center brings it almost due north, and here are the Hawaiian Islands right ahead of it. And with the counterclockwise wind circulation, the strongest winds are on the east and northeast sides of the storm. Well, you can see the, where that puts Honolulu and much of the Hawaiian Islands. It weakens a little bit into a Category 2, but that's still maximum sustained winds of 100 miles per hour with gusts to 120. The farther offshore it is, obviously, the less the winds would be, but still very high surf will certainly pound the uh, Hawaiian uh, shoreline and then uh, very heavy rains of potential from the storm as it very slowly meanders just past the Hawaiian Islands to the south and then curves back toward the south and west before it weakens to a tropical storm. Now, closer to home, we don't need any more rain. We don't have any around here right now, but that will change. Some strong to severe thunderstorms, a possibility on Friday, the highest threat for severe weather to our south and west but I uh, can't rule out an isolated strong to severe storm with gusty winds and hail being the main threats, but also the potential for heavy rain. And the very latest computer model forecasts have brought the precipitation totals up again. This is through 10 a.m. Saturday morning, calling for general amounts close to an inch or an inch and a half across southern Wisconsin with localized amounts of two to three inches. And, of course, areas of, that have received the tremendous flooding over the last week don't need another drop of rain, but there's more on the way. Time lapse from the Queen Bee Radio Skycam in Platteville. We need more of this. Sunshine, just a few fair weather cumulus clouds during the afternoon, and even those dissipate as you get close to sunset. As we check out the live view from the uh, Edgewater Skycam at downtown Madison, it's a clear night. Temperatures are very comfortable out there. Almanac for today shows we started out at 54 degrees this morning. Our high temperature hit 76, and right now we're at 65 with clear skies. The air is calm. The humidity only at 65% because the dew point temperature is in the lower 50s. Around here, a northwesterly wind flow keeping us dry, but that will change with time. Notice the moisture out to the west and the winds becoming more southwesterly. As this weather system moves eastward, it will start to tap into moisture from the Gulf of Mexico and draw it northward. You can see Lane where it is in relation to the Hawaiian Islands and notice the jet stream winds there. 
bringing it closer to the Hawaiian Islands before it starts to curve back out into sea. Around here, our big weather maker is this high pressure system that's keeping us high and dry for the time being. The longer it sits there, the better it is for us. Temperatures right now, 60s, a few places in the 70s out to the west. Those dew point temperatures still in the 50s, but notice those dew points starting to creep back up into the 60s to the west, and that's where the shower and thunderstorm activity will start coming at us by tomorrow night. It'll reach southern Wisconsin and then move through during the day on Friday. Our forecast for the overnight hours, mostly clear skies, low temperature dropping to 54 degrees. For tomorrow, look for a high temperature of 77 with plenty of sunshine and dry weather. On future track, uh, those temperatures dropping off into the uh, middle 50s by early tomorrow morning. Plenty of sunshine for tomorrow, high temperatures upper 70s. The clouds start to come in tomorrow night. Showers and thunderstorms arrive by tomorrow morning or by uh, Friday morning, and then we'll see off and on shower and thunderstorm chances into Friday. High temperatures will be in the mid 60s to the lower 70s. Rainfall amounts, again, now projected to be somewhere around an inch to an inch and a half with heavier amounts of two to three inches and heavier thunderstorms. Seven to 10 day forecast after the showers and storms, the temperatures go up into the 80s and that brings more humidity and almost the daily chance for thunderstorms. Much of the time it won't be raining, but when it does, it can come down hard for short periods of time. So that means we're going to keep a close eye on the weather pretty much for the next week and a half. Boy, it'd be really nice if somehow things could change. We don't get much on Friday. Keep your fingers crossed, but right now it doesn't appear that way. Gary, thank you. Some important suspensions in college football, including one in Columbus, Ohio, as well as the one here in Madison we just mentioned. Jay will have more details coming up in sports.
Ohio State has suspended head coach Urban Meyer for the first three games of the 2018 season, including the Big Ten opener against Rutgers. Ohio State said that Meyer failed to act appropriately over the alleged abuse by assistant coach Zach Smith of his former wife and that Meyer knew more about the situation than he led people to believe. Athletic director Gene Smith also suspended for two weeks. My role is to set a good example. In this instant, I did not live up to the university's standards. The suspensions are tough, but I fully accept them. I wish I could go back and make the different decisions, but I can't. These difficult lessons are a constant reminder of the duties and obligations that I have as a member of this university and this community. Here in Madison, Badgers wide receiver Danny Davis has been suspended for the first two games of the 2018 football season for Davis's connection to the sexual assault charges against teammate Quintez Cephas. Cephas will make his initial appearance in court tomorrow. Head coach Paul Chris says based on the information he has at this time, Davis has been suspended for games against Western Kentucky and New Mexico. Chris adds that if more information becomes available, he'll reevaluate the suspension. This isn't the first time, you know, that I've suspended someone and, and you know, I think that there are standards that you want to uphold to, and I think that's that's okay. I think that's good. And when it doesn't, then you have to take actions. It's the most strict one that I've done to this point, and um, you know, certainly feel that it's appropriate. Davis will be allowed to practice, but won't be able to play in the first two games of the Badger football season. The Prep Mania High School football game of the week Friday night, Middleton at Verona in an early season showdown of the Big 8 Conference. Bill Brophy, Alan Minard, and I will have the game live on TVW and Channel3000.com. Seven Friday night from hometown USA. Former Badger and now Dallas Cowboys center Travis Frederick is battling an autoimmune disease. They couldn't pinpoint anything for a few days, but now they're sure that Frederick has Gaia Barre syndrome, which has been causing neck problems for Frederick, who has never missed a regular season game in his first five years of his NFL career. The Cincinnati Reds can be a dangerous team despite their record, but the Brewers took care of the Reds two out of three to win their series at Miller Park this afternoon. Christian Yelich really starting to hit again. He goes four for four with his 21st home of the season. Yelich has his average back to 314 as he continues his MVP type season in his first year with the Brewers. It's also the first year in the bigs for rookie pitcher Freddy Peralta. Sometimes he's terrible, sometimes he's great. Today he was great. Seven innings, three hits, no runs, two walks, seven strikeouts. Final score, Brewers four, Reds nothing. They're off tomorrow. Brewers will host the Pittsburgh Pirates starting Friday night. And the Cubs play in Detroit tonight. David Bodie, Javier Baez, and Anthony Rizzo all hit homers. Final score, Cubs 8, Tigers 2, so the Cubs stay three games ahead of the Brewers in the Central Division. And we'll be right back.
Gary's back. One final check of the forecast. It's comfortable out there right now. Temperatures are in the middle 60s. Those dew point temperatures still down in the lower 50s. But down the road, after a nice day tomorrow, more showers and thunderstorms. An alert day in the forecast for Friday. The potential for some heavy downpours. And then temperatures well into the 80s for next weekend, all the way through the following week and into Labor Day weekend as well. Gary, thank you. Thanks for joining us for News 3 at 10. Have a good night. Making plans that are weather dependent? Get an accurate 12 hour, even a 10 day forecast. Download the Channel 3000 First Alert Weather app and start planning.